Okay, so now I think we're going to get started with today's topic. And uh, I guess to some extent this brings us back to uh, Harold Edgerton. I think Harold Edgerton is uh, often credited with inventing the uh, uh, instrument we're going to use today or tomorrow. <coughs> However, He, he didn't invent. I, I might as well tell you what, what obviously what, what you already know. And uh, typically I start the introduction to this gadget as uh, with a statement that says, if you had uh, your, your photo service someplace and you have all the photographic equipment that you need, you know, all the large format cameras, big file sizes and telephoto and wide angle lenses and so on, tripods, lights, and so on. What would be the, the, the first piece of instrumentation, uh, high-speed photography type of equipment that I would recommend that you take a look at uh, and you include in your arsenal of, uh, of capabilities? Typically, you don't want to be just a photographer. Let me say that, just a photographer. Because if all you do is make pretty pictures, uh, the likelihood is that when there is a time of financial stress in the company, services like photography are probably the first ones that are going to be cut. Uh, probably before janitors get cut. Uh, because they can always, the corporations figure out, well, they can always farm photography out, or they can get it for free or something. So photography departments that are specific uh, or with in-house photography, they have lost a lot of personnel. Companies are saying, we don't need you. You do great photography, but we don't need you. Um, on the other hand, if you become a service that provides data, quantitative data, something that the, the, the uh, corporations can use uh, to facilitate, to improve their uh, production operations, their manufacturing operations, by reducing waste, by coming up with more efficient ways of doing things, you now start to become a valuable, not an engineer, but a supporting cast uh, to the engineering effort of uh, a manufacturing company. So. Uh, Getting back to the thread, you know, what is it that you would invest in if you had everything that was standard? I would suggest that you invest in something as simple as this, or at least get to understand it. Since you already know what the topic of the presentation today is, I don't think I have to tell you what this is. Yeah, you'll encounter stuff like this uh, in many places. Entertainment is one of them. Essentially, it all boils down to uh, a flashing light source. Now, a stroboscope doesn't have to be a flashing light source, as you'll see shortly. But the stroboscopes, flashing light sources that are uh, in vogue or are widely used in entertainment in particular, um, don't have quite the features of a technical stroboscope. Uh, a stroboscope like this has two characteristics that make it very valuable for quantitative analysis. Uh, one of them is that each individual flash lasts a very short time. It's in the microsecond range, a millionth of seconds. And the other is that the flashing rate is adjustable and calibrated so that you can tell what the time between flashes is. Those are the two things that make one of these very suitable for quantitative analysis of events. <coughs> of 
for example, for example, uh, <coughs> I'm gonna go. <coughs> go take a look at a at an event, a phenomenon, or, a, or an action, uh, which is eminently suitable to be analyzed with a stroboscope. And I would be more than happy to show it to you if I could find it. in my hand just a little while ago. I didn't put it there. No, it's not there. It's not down there. Oh, it's here. Pretty simple thing. An event that is going to uh, do something. <coughs> Predictable, I guess. And it's a fan. A fan is uh, could stand for many processes in manufacturing. It does the same thing over and over again. And what does a fan do? Well, it goes around over and over again. So uh, a stroboscope could be useful to analyze uh, this action, or what the fan is doing. Uh, by, a, by considering what the flash does and considering what the fan does. This is, does the same thing over and over again. We'll make the flash do the same thing, flash over and over again. And then uh, we may be able to see what is so unusual about this particular fan, if anything. Can you tell me what's unusual about the fan? Okay. It's a fast moving event. It goes much too fast for our eyes. So, uh, but we could set up with this stroboscope a particular situation. <coughs> and that might be to make this flash at a particular rate. We can make it flash so that every time the fan is in the same place, every time it makes one revolution, the flash goes off. When the time the flash is off, is off, goes off, this doesn't move. A microsecond. It doesn't move anywhere in microsecond. And then uh, you wait for the fan to make one more turn, and then you flash the fire, the, the flash again. And conceptually, you figure, yeah, I can do that. Right? You have a flash that's, that's calibrated, adjustable, short duration, and you have a fan that's moved too fast for your eye to comprehend. Now, could you analyze this flash with a high-speed uh, uh, video camera, high-speed digital camera? Sure. Could you analyze it with some other technique? Probably. A street camera. Uh, but we'll take a look at this with the stroboscope. <coughs> Let's see. I could do this better maybe with the lights out. Okay, so is the little, little fan there, and uh, it appears to hardly move, right? Uh, would anybody care to stick their finger in there? You get the gut feeling. Yeah, this is this is weird. Okay, the fan is not moving very far fast, but we know that it's moving quite fast. Now, once you put this piece of paper in there, the fan slows down. There's a drag on it, so it unsynchronizes itself from the from the flash. We can make this event. I mean, it's a simple event, but you can imagine a, 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 a punch press operating, squaring out gadgets. Okay? That's a repeatable event. It's the same thing over and over again. <coughs> You could look at that with a stroboscope. A printing press, you know, prints pages of whatever it is, over and over again, the same thing. 
you can analyze a printing press and how it's printing and how the machinery is working live. You don't have to, you don't have to uh, use any kind of, well, in the olden days, I could say you wouldn't have to use any expendable material, but uh, this by itself, right there on the machine, is going to work. As long as it's repeatable. And this relationship between the flash uh, operating and the fan turning exists at more than one frequency of the flash. Okay. Right now, presumably, the fan is turning once every time this flashes. But it could turn twice. The way that we could we could arrange for something like that is to slow the flash down. Right? Because we, we could make the time between flashes twice as long as this. And then this would appear to still stand still. Well, we'll try to do that. Uh, what becomes apparent now, however, is the flicker. Right? Now we could cut this time down even further. Now the flicker becomes even worse. So it could turn around twice, three times, four times, multiple times during the time that the flash flashes. So how do you know when you have synchronized, if you're interested in that, how do you know when you have synchronized the stroboscope with the event? Well, you just keep jacking up jacking up the speed. And when you get to the fastest flashing rate, where you get a single stationary image, that's the speed. Because if we double the speed, uh, let's see if I can go, no, I can go to that on this range, so, 6400 6, something. What happens is now it can only go halfway around. Okay, so you know now that the previous setting was the speed at which this thing is turning. So you have a bit of quantitative <coughs> data about about the operation, whether it's a punch press or whatever. Now the other thing, getting back to uh, this, is you can make the event happen uh, or appear to run forward in time or backward in time. So by simply unsynchronizing the, the, the stroboscope from the speed at which the fan is turning, we can make it appear to turn one way, slowly, or at whatever speed we want. And if we don't like that to turn this way, all we do is we shorten the time. And then it goes the other way. So we can look at events that are happening live as long as they're repeatable. Backwards and forwards. We can make them appear to move backwards and forwards and examine performance characteristics of the of the machine. Uh, so a punch press, you know, might operate real quick and squirt out whatever <coughs> gadgets. Or we can make the gadgets appear to be made instead of cut up. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how I said that way. But we can go backwards in time and forwards in time, although we're always going forwards in time. So just this little bit okay, makes it a quantitative uh, device and analytical device. Uh, I'd be... Uh, not exaggerating to say that stroboscopes are used all over the place, typically by people who don't tell you that they're using them. Uh, <coughs> but you should be aware of them. Uh, textile mills, you know, wherever looms and shuttles go back and forth, the right place for a stroboscope. Uh, you can watch the thread. A sewing machine, for example, is the same thing over and over again. You can watch the, a stitch being made in slow motion, or unmade, either way. Um, so, um, so um, this is fairly easy to relate to. I mean, you, if I told you that this is what we're going to do, you could follow the words, and in your mind, you could probably figured it's out. Yeah, this is going to happen. You set it up and it does happen. Okay, but there are some things in nature that are not quite so easy to predict. And uh, we're going to take a look at that. Right now.
is a demonstration that was originally put, uh, that was originally uh, designed by Harold Edgerton. This is essentially a copy of what he did. So uh, the, this is essentially a fountain. Uh, there's a pump back here, and uh, there'll be water down here, and it, it scoops it up and it squirts it at the top and out, out again. And uh, it has to be primed, and I don't like to do that. So would somebody want to suck on that tube? I guess I got no volunteers. I don't know. <laughs> Before you saw that, it was maybe. Yeah, right, we'll see what happens. I do have to do it. Oh, I know it's because you have to this test. Okay. 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 Uh, the pump is operated by AC, AC current, and with every cycle of the, of the uh, electricity, it, uh, it contracts and expands. So it produces drops at the rate of 120 a second. That's the frequency. Well, it, it does it uh, twice for every cycle, a positive and a negative one uh, input. Maybe it's only a positive, it's just it's a... It's only a sixtieth of a second between rocks. But they still happen so quickly that when you look at this, it looks as if you had opened a faucet. Right? It's a continuous stream coming down. That's because our eyes are just not good enough to see exactly what's happening here. So in order to, to appreciate what the pump is doing, we're going to do it with the strobe stuff. Not exactly, you know, we didn't actually freeze anything. Uh, this thing is still making drops, it's still squirting out at the rate of 60 a second. But now, every 60th of a second, the flash also fires. So when you look at one of these drops right here, you're not looking at the same drop, you're looking at 60 new drops in that spot every second. Now, so why does it look like it's one drop hanging here? Because all the drops that are given distance from the nozzle have the same shape as all the previous drops did, roughly speaking. So they do seem to oscillate a little bit, but that's the idea. If you were to make a picture of this, you know, if I turned the room lights on, and uh, you made a picture by room lights of this, you would capture the, the set of drops, just like this, with an instantaneous exposure. So, um, From a quantitative point of view, when you look at something like this, you can say, well, I know that the flash is flashing 60 times a second. Okay, and the drops are being made at 60 times a second. So I can say that, that the time from one drop to the next, that distance, is how far the drop travels in a 60th of a second. 
how could you measure that? Well, you could include a scale in your photograph, or you can just come up to here, you know, and put a ruler next to it, and you could measure it. Uh, you would notice that the uh, drops down below are farther apart than the drops at top. Now, what's at work there? Gravity. Yeah, very good. Yeah, gravity. They're speeding up. And if you wanted to measure how much they're speeding up and confirm some of your uh, data that you did very early on in the quarter, uh, this would be a way to do it. Now, remember, I said that when you, when you get a, a stationary image like this, uh, the two are synchronized, just as with the fan. You know, we could cut the flashing frequency in half. So instead of flashing 60 times a second, it flashes 30 times a second. What do you think would happen then? Nothing. It would be the same thing, except it would flicker a little bit more, right? Because then, this drop in the next flash would move down to here, instead of only to here. Now, if we double the frequency of the flash, in that case, we would have the in-between positions, right? We would have twice as many drops, because they can only travel half the distance. Now, now, the other thing that we can do is... <coughs> is to change the frequency of the flash. It was troublesome. Now this is probably most effectively uh, demonstrated by one of you whistling. Anybody knows how to whistle? Okay, now whistle inwards. <laughs> so we're seeing the, the event happen backwards in time. We can also see it. <laughs> we can see. I don't think you need to whistle. <laughs> All I'm doing is changing the frequency of the flash just a little bit, and I can and I can change it more, and then it, it, they go faster. Or I can make them go back up faster. <laughs> you can touch it if you like. Sure. Say, well, I'd like to uh, see if I could pass my fingers between two drops because there's a little space there. Uh, it's kind of difficult to do that. Not that it could I'm be really done. Talented though, so, you, uh, you'd have to go real fast and be lucky, right? I'm going to get you really wet. It's okay. <laughs> well, maybe you did it that time. That time I didn't do it. Never yeah. before. Yeah, we missed that time. Too. The low ones are easier, right? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> oh, that's right. They're moving faster. But the time between them is still a sixtieth of a second. So whether you go in the lower ones or the top ones, it doesn't really matter. Here they're moving slower. They're not going to move faster, but it's still a sixtieth. Why is the green not between them? Why is the what? That's Why? really cool. Why is it not forcing all in between them? Because they're not there. I have to sit down now, huh? Okay, yes. <coughs> Otherwise, I'll make you drink this stuff. So, Edgerton came up with this. It's called the Piddler. <laughs> and uh, Edgerton actually, uh, in his latter years, he had two of them operating simultaneously. So, he had two Piddlers. And one Piddler interacting with another Piddler. It was kind of neat. And maybe someday I'll make myself a double one too. But hopefully, uh, this gives you an idea uh, of the power of a flashing light source as uh, popularized by Edgerton. So we'll use it for something like this or something else. As long as it's repetitive and too fast for the eye to catch. And if it's not too fast for the eye to catch, there's no point. Uh, but if it is, in that case, think stroboscope.
just like you think about uh, about some number when somebody says neutral density. What's the number? Yeah, very good. Okay. So uh, these gadgets, although not cheap, are uh, probably within the range of uh, expenditure that you would spend for a scientific instrument. Uh, maybe five thousand dollars. Well, what's uh, what's uh, Nikon D whatever super duper? D3S. Yeah. There you go. So this or that. You already have that. That's hypothetical. Uh, so in the context of uh, expenditures for becoming a useful quantitative contributor to uh, a photographic organization, uh, stroboscopes should be considered. But I figured that the $5,000 price tag might uh, put you off. So um, we're going to take a look at uh, an application that doesn't involve $5,000. But you think about, well, you know, what, what is a stroboscope? Well, it's, it's, it's a light source that illuminates a scene every so often. But there are more than, there's another way to do the same thing, or roughly the same thing. All you want to do is interrupt the view of a camera or your eyes of something that is in front of you. So what we'll do is, uh, first of all, I think, I think what, it, what I'd like to do is to make do a demonstration of, uh, I don't like the word out of the box thinking, but we have been doing projects where our interest was in making sharp photographs of fast moving events. Well, going to do now is something other than that. I've got to get my stuff to you. Oh, and, and uh, what I like to do, because I'm going to make a photograph, <coughs> is to uh, do this without pretense, so, so, it, so that you can see every step that was involved in the making of the pictures, and you don't have to say, oh, you know, you use magic or something. Demonstrations work best if the audience can see not only the good parts, but also the bad ones. What do you learn from those? There's some place I have a camera. Here. Anybody have a step-down ring on them? No, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I just can't find mine, so we'll have to improvise. Nice that Step down rings are very useful gadgets. Okay, you should all have one. Come on, I loosened it up. Bring the camera right next to you. I'll take the upper of the camera up to the TV monitor.
I'll put an extension in between. Push the button and see what the camera does. Oh, look at that. There's something there. I guess it's sort of kind of going to work, eh? Okay. All right. You know how to put that on manual? You can do it. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Oh, yeah, I guess it's, on ball, so. it's okay. Hey, something came out. Yeah, that's a ball. And, and guessing. Oh, you did it on ball, right? Sure. And, and yeah, and you guessed at it. That's good. So now we're going to photograph some subject matter. This particular thing, I mean, I've done it before, so the concept typically is, uh, well, we're going to photograph a ping pong ball. You might be a photographer someplace working for the Hong Su uh, ping pong ball company in Beijing, right? And they say, well, you know, we, we make the best, world's best ping pong balls, and here's one of them. So, make a photograph of the ping pong ball. Well, you know, you, you take one of these and start to get creative and you know, put the ping pong ball over there and you make a picture of it. A lot of people know how to do that. A lot of people probably better than you. I don't know. But a lot of people know how to do that. As they might make the photograph more exciting by uh, putting two ping pong balls together. They might draw faces on them. They might put them in costumes and stuff. Halloween costumes. Yeah, make it a pumpkin out of it. <laughs> a lot of people know how to do that. But you want to make something a little bit different. So uh, instead of photographing the ping pong ball just sitting there, what we're going to do is photograph it right now by uh, doing this. So when I tell you to, open the shutter. And uh, when we're done, I'll tell you to close it. All right? So open it. Wow, close it. It was a little bit too uh, vigorous in the throat. <coughs> However, uh, yeah, yeah, get back to the display. I think you could, uh, again, a gut feeling would tell you, oh yeah, you know, we'd get something like this. Let's make it a little more exciting by doing another one. Open. So, uh, put it back on display. We're taking advantage of a of, of blur. Now, you, you could say, well, the contrast isn't right and so on. Well, you can fix that. But what you got is, again, a bit of quantitative information if you take the trouble to uh, look into it. Uh, first of all, you, you can tell that during the time that the shutter was open that this bounced a number of times, right? You know, one, two, three, et cetera. Uh, if you look at the at the uh, information, the image information closely, you'll notice that these curves are all brighter at the top than at the bottom. Why do you think that is? Same Same angle angle bit. They are actually at the top. Theoretically, the ball is doing what? Stop. They're stopped. <laughs> when you think about infinitesimals, for a very short time, that ball is standing still. Now, you could... Uh, Maybe you're interested in finding out, well, how much height it lost between bounces. That's a quantitative thing. Uh, what is lacking for you to do that? Scale. Scale. But actually, scale is not lacking. Where is it? The ball. Yes. Yeah. You can measure the ball. You know how big it is. 
And you can measure the displacement here in terms of ball widths. And say, oh, if the ball is one inch, and this happens from here to here, is three times the size of the ball, well, it lost three inches between from one to the next. <coughs> and you can do that for <coughs> it's losing less and less as time goes on. That could be graphed. If you're into the creative side of an annual report or something, well, you can use this as the basis for a creative presentation of it. It's something that you didn't have to make. It, the ball made itself, right? You can change the, the shape and so on. Uh, you, you can flip it. You can multiply it, et cetera, et cetera. But you had the original uh, design for this that came out of kind of uh, uh, the performance of the ball itself. So it, it might have a creative application. It might have a technical application. But what we did was something that in high-speed photography we normally don't do, which is making blurry photographs. But even at the very beginning of the quarter, we were getting information out of blurry photographs, right? Newton's uh, law was proven by blur. <coughs> it didn't look quite as pretty as this. Now, the one thing, and there's another thing that you can, that, that, that you, if at some point you ever decide to get a graduate degree, I don't recommend that especially a PhD. This could be the basis for a PhD uh, presentation. Now where is, where, is the, where is the secret to making this a PhD presentation? It's in the changing brightness of this line. That can be equated to, if you figure out how, to the speed at which the ball was moving. Because right now, we don't know how fast it's moving, do we? Because we have no time information. You know? Do we know what the time is from here to here? We don't. So we don't have timing information, but we have density information. And notice that the density, or the brightness, gets higher and higher over here. What does this indicate to us? The ball is traveling slower and slower. Now, I believe that it's possible to work backwards from essentially exposure to speed. Because if this ping pong ball were traveling infinitely fast, it would, there would be no record of it, right? And as it slows down, the record gets denser and denser and denser. So if you know what the density would be, <coughs> is associated with a particular exposure time, you could say that the ball traveled its own width during the time of the exposure. Anyway, this would be called sensitometric velocimetry. And velocimetry is something that engineers, technicians, and corporations and so on are very interested in. They want to know how fast things are moving. I'll warn you that uh, solving this sensitometric velocimetry <coughs> problem is not trivial uh, because the background starts to influence the moving subject. And somehow you've got to figure out how to, how to get rid of it. Now, if the, if the background were a black hole, you'd have no problem. But you don't. And, and getting rid of that noise, again, is, uh, is what makes this uh, uh, a thinking person's problem. So, uh, we don't know how fast the ball is traveling, but we might be interested in it. We need to provide time information. Well, we could do that. We could do that with this little flashing light, right? The strobe. That means we could put the strobe over here, and as it's flashing, you know, this thing is bouncing around, and that trace would be interrupted. You would see the ball at one point, another point, another point, and so on. You know what the time between those were. But it would cost you $5,000. So uh, at one time, there was an elementary school uh, uh, young lady who wrote to me and he said, uh, I'd like to uh, do a project for a science fair that's related to the work of Harold Edgerton. I want to photograph bullets flying. And I said, you don't want to do that. 
However, Edgerton was intimately connected with stroboscopes. I mean, that's essentially his design. So I said, oh, no. What could she do that uh, would relate to Edgerton but would not be expensive? And I suggested to her to look into a mechanical stroboscope. What's a mechanical stroboscope? Well, it's a black disc. Yeah, it could be white, but typically it's black. And it has a slot in it. And this can be rotated. You go around like that. And it can be attached to maybe a camera lens. However, you don't need that. You can just look through this. Okay? And as this thing spins, you think about, well, what's happening? Well, my view of whatever it is I'm looking at is interrupted every so often. Well, here my view is interrupted. There, the light is provided every so often. So in a way, you could say, well, they do the same thing. But over there, you have to light things up. Over here, you don't have to use ambient light. Uh, the one drawback of stroboscopes like that is that you can't really use them under sunlight. Why? Well, because the, the output of those is minuscule. So if you wanted to, for example, light up the blades of a helicopter as they're moving, not standing still, in that case, that would not work. Because you, you have to light up the whole helicopter. But this would. Okay. Now, how do you get action-stopping capability out of a mechanical stroboscope? Anybody? Spinning it real fast. Nope. Spinning it really fast will simply increase the frequency, but you want to get action-stopping capability. Have a small slit. Have a small slit, yeah. Cut that down to a smaller size. So if this thing is turning, let's say, 360 degrees per second, and the width of that is one degree, what do you think the exposure time is? One three hundred sixtieth of a second. So can you get less than that? Sure. Uh, I mean that that would mean a three hundred sixty degree turn every second. Okay, that would give you a three hundred sixtieth of a second. But this thing you could spin maybe you know, you know three thousand times a second, uh, no, sixty times a second or so. So that would be uh, whatever 60 times 360. That would be the exposure time at that particular frequency. Uh, so that would not be too bad. Now, admittedly, the, the electronics uh, uh, version gives you shorter duration okay, than this would. But, but maybe you don't need a microsecond exposure. You know, that's way overkill for a, for a helicopter blade. It's not moving that fast. And when you're talking about maybe a 10,000th of a second, that you can get with this. So, you say, oh, you know. So anyway, the young lady uh, did, in fact, uh, do a science fair project. And I think that she did quite well. Um, I don't know how she placed, but she sent me a thank you note. So I assume that she did well. And then I said to myself, oh, you know what? Maybe I should look into that. <laughs> so I did. And as a result of her uh, uh, inquiry, I started to promote the use of these, not only for real, but also for demos. So um, let's see how I'm going to do this. Since I am uh, short of a step-down ring, which would be useful to have. Uh, because my camera lens is just a little bit larger than Like, uh, I feel like bringing up the piddler. Because you saw what the electronic flash or the electronic stroboscope could do. And I'm telling you that you could do the same thing with this. Okay. $5, $5,000. <coughs> well, maybe there is some point. Uh, now I need to provide a source of power to this motor. Thank uh -huh. 
light on the seat, simply. Now I'd like to ask for somebody to come up here and confirm the fact that what you see through here is pretty much the same as what you saw earlier. Anybody? Is it the same? Oh, wait a minute. Is it moving up or down? Up. Down. Same thing. Anybody want to look? Pretty much what we have there. Yeah. Okay. So, called on to, to like do demonstrations uh, for people, uh, maybe uh, you should add this to your arsenal of demonst demonstrations because it's cheap. It is uh, it's visually kind of compelling. But now, because we are in... <coughs> uh, I think we, we ought to do this uh, at this point, and then we'll take a break. I guess you could just hold the motor with your hand. Yeah. And uh, what we'll do now, I'll you know, wake it up. Is um, let's see. Yeah, maybe we should go up on here. Also. Yeah, I had actually turned it down from four to two. So. Okay. Five. Okay. Okay. Let's try that. So we'll turn on the stroboscope. And uh, you're still on B, right? Yes. Okay, open the shutter. Okay, close. Hey, not too bad. If you'd like to uh, see more pictures of the uh, of the ping pong ball as it goes across, uh, let's move up the. Uh, will increase the frequency. Okay, go ahead. Close it. Take a look at the display. I'll take this away. Uh, I hope you agree that that's pretty good. We're going to do this again, so uh, is it on display now? So it's going to stick there? Okay, for now we can figure out what the speed is. Now it's going to be average speed from one image to the other, uh, but that can be uh, uh, worked out if you have the speed of different distances, because now you have timing information. You don't actually know what the time is, but I think you can figure out the ball moved from here to there in the time it took that thing to make one turn. <coughs> the thing that you don't know is how long it took took it to make one turn, right? You don't know what the frequency is. So maybe you'd like to find out what the frequency is so that you could say that, you know, from here to here is it one, one second or half a second or something. Now the scale 
as, as we find out, is built in. It's the ping-pong ball. That's the distance. But, and now you have time, too, but you don't know what it is. Now we're going to find out how you, how you figure out time, or how you figure out frequency. Well, we could use the stroboscope over there to figure out the, what the frequency of this is, right? You flash that flash and make a single station image, and we read, it, read out from the stroboscope what the frequency is. Eh, $5,000. We're going to do this time. Not again. This time, uh, let me just see. Five, six. Okay, so let me show you how you get it. Five, six, uh, Quarter second. Quarter second, same ISO. Okay, so there's all that there. Okay, the one thing uh, that uh, people don't often realize is that <coughs> manufacturers put an awful lot of effort into making sure that when you select an exposure time, that exposure time is accurate. If you set one second, you like it to be one second. If you set a half a second, you like it to be one half a second. So this time, don't wait for me to tell you to do anything. Do it when you feel like it. Okay? Okay. I'm going to drop the ball, and after it's moving, you operate the camera. Ready? Well, I don't have this on right now. I'm sure go. Oh, that would uh, produce a black picture, wouldn't it? Well, right now, yes. Okay. All right. Here we go. Yeah, that's what some of these things I call experiments. Okay, okay let's take a look at what happened. Uh, now we're going to use the longer exposure time, but it doesn't matter. The idea is here. In a quarter of a second, it made four images. Right? In a quarter of a second, it made four. So how long will it, how many will it make, let's say, in one second? Sixteen. So what's the time between images? A sixteenth of a second. So now you can go back to the other curve, you know, where all of them are in there, and say, the time between every one of these ping pong balls is a sixteenth of a second. And you can figure out the speed. How many ping pong balls width did it travel? And you did it for what? Five bucks plus a good shutter on your camera. You didn't use any fancy phantom cameras. You didn't use, uh, there's actually some danger to that. You know, because when people figure out that you can do things on the cheap, they won't give you the funding to get one of them. <laughs> All right? We just tell them we need the funding for that and then build one of those? All right. <laughs> I, I just want to say, sometimes it, it, it's useful to just remember principles. Where do things come from? instead of immediately jumping toward top of the line. For many applications, something like this works pretty well. Anyway, that's my soapbox for right now, and, uh, and then later on we're going to talk about what it is that you're going to be doing uh, tomorrow. So I'll take a break. Uh, any questions? Okay. There are no handouts today, so or reprints, as they say. Five minutes and we'll continue.